Welcome back to the PFC podcast. The views and opinions you are about to hear are the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of anyone else. Now on to the podcast. Welcome back to the PFC podcast. This is Dennis and today I'm with Brad. How are you doing today? I'm awesome, Dennis. It's great to be back with you today. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. And you're definitely the perfect guy to talk to about today's topic <laughs> of gas anesthesia and how much better it is than what we're doing. So um, <laughs> um, I am definitely so, a, a guy to yeah. talk about passing gas. Yes, correct. <laughs> You know, I've been around when you talk. Like uh... <laughs> that's right. That's right. I can fill the room. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, since you know, fairly recently we did a podcast, so I think we can probably skip the introductions quick um, and just kind of jump into the topic. So um, way back in the day when I went through the school, we did gas anesthesia, and um, and like as a as a like a note, uh, we did uh, some IV drip anesthesia. Um, now things have drastically changed, and we only do drip anesthesia. Uh, I guess is there a, a good reason why we changed, or? Well, I, you know, I, I think part of that uh, it, it, it's hard to say when things start to shift. Sometimes it's it is kind of a, a new hotness type of a thing. Whenever. You know, I, I brought a lot of the, uh, the Tiva technique with the ketamine versa drips in, and um, a lot of it was, well, we, we don't have vaporizers in the field, you know, to do this a certain way like we do in the schoolhouse. Um, it, part of that was a safety thing. Part of it was logistics of it. Mm -hmm. um, what, you know, I'm not running around with a vaporizer like you learned on uh, in the schoolhouse in my backpack, you know, right. uh, what can I do with a very small amount of uh, cube and space in my bag? And um, so that, I think, drove a lot of the uh, Tiva type techniques. Um, people understood them pretty well. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and then what started to happen, I think, though, was it was like, oh, well, we'll just get rid of gas, you know, completely. And we'll just shift to this and this solves all the problems. And OK, let's do that. I'm not saying it was quite that, you know, uh, direct, but um, which is a answer. It's not always the greatest answer because, uh, you know, there may be situations where you're deployed in certain situations that I don't know. You're out of ketamine. You're out of fentanyl versus, uh, you know, um, and lo and behold, this may be what I have, you know, depending mm -hmm. on the environment you're in, in a lot of these developing countries. And how am I going to get this done? And is it a way? And it's absolutely a way. One, you know, because one of the things, you know, we'll talk about a little bit is that gas anesthesia from the very beginning, it's the hallmark of what started all of anesthesia all the way back in 1846. Um, and ether was the gas of the day uh, at that time. And gas covers all the aspects of what general anesthesia is. Okay. Instead of having to mix different drugs in and things in, in the bag, gas does it all. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit um, as well. But um, a part of it is um, as far as when you are doing gas anesthesia is, uh, you know, we're back to the before I do anything part of any type of a sedation or any type of a deeper sedation. You know, you always have to make sure that your mismate is done in the beginning. OK, and if people that haven't heard mismade, I don't want to run back through all the details of mismade. But um, as a part of that, you know, the very first thing on the M of mismade is the machine. It's the anesthesia machine in the operating room. It is. Um, if you're in a field environment, you would hope to have at least uh, the the IUPAC Omita drawover that's the mm -hmm. deployed um, type of a, a, a system that uh, you guys trained on in the schoolhouse. Um, and then, you know, the NATO countries have what's called the tri-service uh, you know, vaporizer as well. Mm -hmm. And that's a great little piece of kit 
uh, if you have it, because it can it can vaporize different types of gas, not just one type. Um, and so that that's interesting. But um, it's uh, not FDA approved, so to speak, to be using that in all types of environments like back here in the States. Now, we were able to train on it because we check certain bar- boxes with the FDA to train people in deployment uh, anesthesia in the hospital where I trained at, at Madigan. And we had a room set up to where that we could do that and actually train on that device because there are a lot of quirks to it. And one of the reason that it wasn't FDA approved was because it doesn't have all the bells and whistles to alarm at you and tell you there's something going wrong. You know, one of those things is the gas analyzer um, that you're typically not going to have in, in a, any kind of a field environment. Uh, and I'll, I'll kind of talk about that in a little bit. But the gas analyzer is the thing that analyzes the anesthesia gas going in and coming out. And it actually gives you a percent. So, you know how asleep that that person is so to speak um and you're not going to have that with you know the environment that we're talking about so right you have to be hyper hyper vigilant if you're using gas as as the person and as a part of being the monitor part of the mismade um you know this isn't one of those things that you walk away from if you're going to do it you're you're in it Okay, you are managing the airway, which you're also managing the gas of the anesthesia. You're monitoring constant vital signs. So you're constantly measuring pulse. Uh, You're looking at the respiratory rate, the quality of the respirations. Um, BP, at least I'd like it every three minutes, but, you know, three to five minutes. So it's it's a full time job up there whenever you're administering uh, gas anesthesia, because You know, if you were to walk away from it, so to speak, oh, I'll do this and I'll go down there and I'll work on the guy's leg. They're going to wake up, you know, so it's not one of those deals. You need to have somebody that's in charge of running that. So I think that's a little bit of it. And the other thing to talk about, too, is like we're talking about gas anesthesia as the sole agent. Now, they're doing gas anesthesia in every OR every single day. And the great thing about that is as a uh, medic or any kind of a practitioner, you know, you can go in, talk to the CRNAs or the anesthesiologist and say, you know, here's why I'm here and this is what I want to look at. I want to watch how gas anesthesia is done. However, they are doing combined techniques in the operating room. So they're using narcotics. They're using a lot of times muscle relaxants and there's more things added on And it's not a pure gas anesthetic uh, like we're talking about that you could do in the field. Okay. Um, However, that being said, the best place to go in and witness the stages of anesthesia is to get into the OR and watch what is going on. Now, the key to that is all too often what happens when guys come into the operating room is they normally come in and the reason they're coming in is they're coming in to intubate, which is great. You know, I, I want to come in, I want to, uh, you know, uh, secure the airway. I want to see what that's like. And that's fantastic. So they see the induction piece of the anesthetic, but they normally are off. Once they get it, they're normally off to another room to do it again. And they don't see the waking up piece of it, which is mm-hmm. critical. And that's where in the modern uh, operating room, that's where you're going to actually see the stage two that we're going to talk about. That's the danger stage. And that's the one that you really want to be able to identify. So that's key. Now, from the historical side of it, like I was talking about before, you know, this started in Boston, Massachusetts, up at Mass General Hospital um, in 1846, long time ago. And Dr. Morton was a dentist who actually did the first successful uh, demonstration of ether for a general surgery type uh, of a case. Um, and so much so, it, it took off so much that. Uh, that observation surgery area was named the ether dome because that's all they did after that, you know, every day, you know, ether, 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 and they would come in and, you know, people would watch the surgeries and wow, this isn't 
you know, barbaric anymore. We can actually have a patient that can hold still, that we can do complicated type things and save people's lives. Fantastic. You know, ether was so good. Uh, it was used all the way up into the 1980s, even in the United States. Now, it really started trailing off in the 1960s when some of the other agents came along. And the, and the key with those other agents that came along was that they weren't flammable or explosive. OK, and like it or not, that's the that's the drawback of ether. OK, is that it is flammable big time. OK, and if it uh, gets ex- exposed to too much light, it can form crystals and technically it can explode. Okay. Um, so yay. Uh, we switched to other agents, uh, like isoflurane, halothane, there's more out there, but you know, again, uh, probably using isoflurane back going through the schoolhouse when, when you were using the vaporizer. Um, it, it's been around for quite a while as well. Um, but the truth is, Ether uh, was a great anesthetic. You know, it was very safe. Um, it just caught fire and blew up. You know, and and uh, and is a downside. Well, the, yeah, it's a downside. You know, um, uh, I wouldn't be using it on any aircraft. Some some crew chief would lose his mind, right? Unless I'm starting an engine. Um, but the, but the thing about it was, uh, you got to remember also is. Uh, one of the great things, you know, when you were talking to Dave Harden recently about austere surgery and Dave was talking about, you know, you got to communicate between the team. And I'm talking before the surgery ever starts, you know, you got a war game, what's going on. If you were in there using ether today, that means you better tell everybody because there better not be any electric cautery going on or any bovie pins or anything that's going to produce a spark or you're going to have the time of your life. OK, <laughs> that type of a situation. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But people forget about that piece of it. And they say they remember, but th- they really don't. Um, early on, there was another uh, uh, popular anesthetic called chloroform, which I'm sure if anybody's watched any old movie and they poured it on the rag and threw it on somebody's face, it knocked people out. And, you know, they would kidnap people with chloroform and yada, yada. Um, chloroform was great because it was better tolerated when you smelled it Uh and it worked much, it worked much faster than ether to knock people out. Problem with chloroform later, they figured out was it caused like cardiac arrhythmias and it had some, uh, liver toxicity as well. And so later on it, it fell out of favor. Um, but it was very, you know, back in like World War One, World War Two, it was very, uh, popular to put somebody to sleep originally with, with chloroform because it will work faster. And then they would switch to ether once they were asleep, you know, mm-hmm. type of a deal. Um, but, you know, it's, it's gone the way of the dodo as well. Um, but, you know, again, they were doing a lot of these uh, cases back then uh, without all the bells and whistles that we have today. And, They were doing that by being very vigilant with the airway, the heart rate, um, the, you know, the blood pressures once the blood pressure uh, came on the scene um, to be able to vigilantly monitor the patient. Now, what I was talking about before, one of the great things about gas anesthesia is if that's all that you have, it is it covers every aspect of general anesthesia by itself. That is one of the huge benefits of gas, and it always was. Um, I think I was telling you before, there's actually a uh, a training video on YouTube uh, from 1944. And if you look it up, you just type in open drop ether uh, number two, 1944. And it brings up this black and white training video from back then. And they are doing uh, open abdominal surgery with nothing but an ether bottle and a uh, gauze ma- uh, mask on the patient. And they go through the whole thing. It's, it's really interesting about, you know, study your history uh, type of a deal. Um, so the, the deal is, is that, you know, the hallmarks are it gives you the reversible loss of consciousness. You get whole body analgesia with it. You get amnesia with it. 
and you get a degree of muscle relaxation without using muscle relaxants to a degree. Um, if you're using just the sole agent part of it. Uh, now, the muscle relaxation, uh, relaxation piece has to do with the deeper that you take the patient, the more muscle relaxation that you will get. It's never going to be on the same level as uh, using like vecuronium or those types of things, uh, but you will get some muscle relaxation. And like I said, they were doing open abdominal procedures and things along those lines. So that leads us to what we call the stages of anesthesia that was uh, created by uh, Goodell back in the day. And this is this goes all the way back to your World War I type stuff, World War II type stuff. Of the things that they noticed doing uh, just gas anesthesia. And these are the things that you can still witness uh, parts of these today in the in the modern operating room, especially like I'm saying, if you stay all the way through the case and watch the wake ups uh, at the end of the case. But he broke it down into basically uh, four stages. And stage one was from how we are right now, basically to you think about your conscious sedation levels you know, your mild, moderate, you know, heavy sedation levels. Um, and then once you start to go a little bit deeper than that, that's what we call stage two. That's the danger zone that we run into. Okay. Because in stage two, they are not awake, even though people think they are because their uh, patient will still move around, but it's an excited delirium type of a state. Okay. Um, and you got to remember the last sense in the body to go to sleep is your hearing. Um, and it kills me whenever you're waking up a patient, how everyone in the room wants to yell and scream, you know, right. and, you know, you're, you're putting somebody in kind of like hell, you know, when you're doing that. So you gotta, you gotta remember that piece, but stage two is the danger zone because of a few things. One, the jaw, the masseter muscles get very, very tight so that it's harder to deal with any kind of an airway issue at that point. Um, one of the hallmark signs of it is um, their breathing becomes very irregular, even to the point they'll hold the breath, you know, and that's a problem because when they hold their breath and you're trying to get them down into where we're, our goal is down into stage three is like they're not breathing any more gas in. OK, they're in kind of this in between uh, zone. So a lot of people kind of like, oh, they want to back off at that point. It's like, no, 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 you got to you got to keep going at that point, you know. Yeah. Um, so there's breath holding, there's gasping. Um, that's where you can get uh, the laryngospasms in the airway. Again, that's your, your danger zone. And one of the other telltale signs is when you uh, lift the eyelids back, the eyes are have a disconjugated stare. And once you see that in the operating room, you won't mistake it really for anything else. You know, I mean, you peel them back and you're like, whoa, okay, I see that. I know what that is now. That's another uh, sign like I'm in the danger zone right now. I need this person. If I'm putting them to sleep, I need to keep going and get them down and get them down to that, that stage three. Now, the thing about today's anesthesia, we, like I said, we use gas all the time. But for safety issues and also because of speed, we take people and we use the IV induction agents such as propofol, atomidate, ketamine. And the reason we do that is because we want to take them from awake all the way through the stage two really fast, right to stage three. And now I, I don't have to deal with that. I'm all the way down and now I can intubate the patient, secure the airway, and and it's much safer to do it that way. And that's why we do that. But again, however, once they're down there, they got to come back up and that's yep. where waking up, that's the, that's the zone. And that's why I'm saying, if you go to the OR and watch this, you're going to see every single patient come up through stage two and you can witness it and see like, okay, I know what that looks like now. That's where things can be seriously trouble for me type of a deal. Um, if I could ask you now, just a quick question about waking yeah. patients up. Now, mm -hmm. from what I remember, uh, gas versus using something like propofol or um, we didn't have fentanyl or ketamine. We just had, if I remember right, uh, we used a lot of morphine. Um, yeah. 
We had a tiny bit of ketamine, but I think I want to mm. say we used that as like the sedative, um, mm. and we induced with propofol. Um, but mm -hmm. I, if I remember correctly, when we did use the gas, the, they said the benefit was um, reversal of the gas was a lot faster than using like your uh, systemic agents, like your your ketamine and more definitely morphine. Um, and so they would come, they would be able to recover faster. Is that is uh, that true for gases or no? <laughs> oh, okay. It, it, oh, well, I'll, I'll caveat that. Um, gas is a direct correlation, one, um, to how much of it you were using and how long you were using mm -hmm. it for. And um, I, I'm not going to, I mean, this is like years of anesthesia school, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but all the tissues of the body absorb the gas differently and at yep. different amounts. And so fat's different than muscle, it's different than bone, it's different than, okay. Um, and so the solubility of the gas is has a big uh, factor to do with that. The more, actually, the more soluble the gas is, the longer it takes to get somebody to sleep, that's ether. Mm -hmm. And the longer it is to wake them up, because it takes longer for it to leach back out of their system to get to their lungs to then breathe it off to get it out of their brain so that they can wake up. Yep. Okay. Whereas IV anesthetics, like your propofol, you know, that's going to last seven minutes, yep. you know, boom, you know, you give it, they go to sleep where people get confused is it's like, so we put somebody to sleep with propofol and then you're in there innovating and doing those things. And we're reaching behind you on the anesthesia machine. We're already turning the gas on. So right. as soon as you hook, as soon as you hook up to the ventilator, or the bag, they're getting all that gas in quickly and we have it way turned up so that before they wake up from the propofol, the gas keeps them down at that, that uh, stage three level and that kind of plane three level of stage three of what we're looking for. Okay. But that's why it's important to go and watch the wake ups, yep. you know, cause you can literally, at least in the operating room, it's awesome because that gas analyzer I can see the percentage and I can literally with every breath, watch it go down fast or slow. And I can tell when that person's going to start to wake up type yep. of a deal. Um, so partially if you didn't use very many, very much gas and you, you didn't use it very long, it, it can go away pretty quick. It's just not the norm when you're using gas, especially okay. if you're using gas just by itself, because you used it probably a lot getting them down to stage three. And then right. therefore there's a chunk coming out. It just takes time. Um, okay. so that's, I'm sure that's, I screwed it up. No, no, no. That, that, that's an <laughs> absolutely great question, man, because, you know, um, it's sometimes things are a little backwards with, with the way that you, you kind of perceive of what they are, but it also depends on the agent, you know, right. like I'm, like I'm saying, Oh yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So some of the newer gases, which are very expensive and, have, and they're very precise, they go on fast. They come off fast really to save time again, time and mm -hmm. money in the operating room. Yeah. Um, but you're not going to see those gases, desflurane. You're not going to see that in the field. It needs yeah. a special vaporizer and you're just not going to see it. Um, so it's, it's, it is a time thing and it's how much gas that I actually have to use on that person. Yeah. Now, once you get them down towards stage three, we're, we're going through that stage two, that danger zone. You know, how do I know that I'm down in that stage three zone where I, that's where I want to be? I'm looking for things like automatic breathing. So the, the jerky breathing or holding the breath, those kinds of things will stop. My automatic breathing centers take over. So breathing becomes, you know, very, very stable or it should. Um, the eyeballs, like I was talking about before, will come back to the midline and look more normal. Um, and that's another really good way to, to realize you've gone from two to three. Um, they, it starts to, uh, the muscle relaxation starts to paralyze the intercostal muscles some. And so you, your breathing becomes more from the diaphragm at that point as well. That's another way to kind of look at it. Um, and that's, that's where you want to be without getting too complicated into it. And that's yeah. where you want to, 
that's where you want to hold your patient. There is stage four that we never want to go to. Um, right. That is that is basically cardio collapse. They, the respiratory run center is shut down. They're not breathing and um, death follows. So we don't want to right. be down there. Uh, right. Type of thing. Um, so all that being said, um, talking about a, a few of the characteristics of the gases, um, one of the big, big ones you may hear is what's called a MAC value, M-A-C, uh, which stands for minimum alveolar concentration. Um, now, each gas has a MAC value, and that's a relative number to things like age, and you know, uh, kids are a little bit different, their number than adult versus elderly. Um, but it is a starting point, and what it really means is not how much gas they're breathing in, but it's how much gas that's coming out. Mm-hmm. And that's a way to measure what the what's being seen in the brain. And once you hit what's called one MAC, that is where if you made a surgical incision, 50% of the people wouldn't move at all, but 50% of the people might move some. Okay. And, and when you're doing pure gas, people forget like they may move and you may have to give them a little bit more because they just need a little bit more. The way I kind of uh, talk about that is like since guys now are very used to doing the ketamine drips that I taught them, that calculation that I give them, right? Uh, that kilogram body weight divided by two, if that's my cc's per hour start with that drip that we do that's a starting point. That's not an absolute, you know, I may have to go up or I may can turn it down a little bit. So when you look at these, uh, isoflurane has a Mac value of 1.15%. If I could see it on the gas analyzer. All right. Uh, halothane, which you may run into downrange still, it's banned in the United States now, but, um, it's still popular in the developing worlds because it's very cheap. It can be very safe. It's got liver toxicity issues is why the FDA banned it here. Its mag value is 0.75% approximately. And ether kind of has a more wide range to it where it's anywhere from like 2%, but you'll see 3 4 5%. Um, and that has to do with how uh, soluble it is um, in the person. But And it also has to do with how pure the ether actually is that you're that you're using uh, type of a deal. So my goal should be, you know, at least one Mac to be able to do most of the things that we're talking about doing to get somebody into stage three, they're safe. And that's where I want to keep them. The problem is I don't have the gas analyzer to read that number. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? In, In the, in the field environment we're talking about. So I have to rely on the things like, the heart rate, the blood pressure, how is their breathing looking? What are their eyeballs look like? Are they, are they in that straight, not disconjugated look? Um, I have to rely on those types of things, those physical things that I can pick up on, not the machine uh, to tell me what it is kind of a deal. So uh, the other thing to remember about some of these gases is um, uh, remember I was talking about before either being flammable and explosive, um, anesthesia gas in the field, or let me back up a step. In the operating room, we have an elaborate scavenging system where the waste gas that the patient is blowing out gets sucked, you know, into the completely different place and it's vented out and no harm, no foul. It's not floating around the room, in other words. Uh, in the austere environment, every time, you know, people bring up, well, I'm using the vaporizer or I want to do the uh, open air technique, you know, the 1940s, you know, type of deal. This is this is what I'm going to do. And I, you, know, um, you need to understand that waste gas coming off of that patient is in the room. Mm-hmm. OK, especially if you're doing the open mass technique. Um, and Mike may talk about that when he's doing that. Um, if you're doing something like that, you don't want to have your face all the way down next to the patient. Because <laughs> you're you're getting it too, and you may go down before he does. You know that kind of thing. Um, right. Sounds crazy, but I'm I'm here to tell you. Uh, also, anesthesia gas is heavier than air. 
So what it will do is uh, you may have seen like old uh, World War One movies with chlorine gas, how it settled mm-hmm. into the trenches. It made it so deadly and it would crawl along. But you could see it because it had a green tint to it. Imagine that anesthesia gas is on the floor floating around, hovering down there. Or it's on the tabletop at first. It will t- literally travel across the tabletop, and then as it comes off, it will dip down to the down onto the floor, and it will search things out. So it will search out if it's ether, flame, you know, and that's that's the danger behind it, right? Um, so uh, if I am in a house doing this, I'm in some safe house somewhere, and somebody has a gas stove with a pilot light, shut yeah. it off. If you're doing something like this, you know, or the hot water heater or yeah. the crappy candles, generator yeah. that's run. Yeah. Candles. Yeah. That's, that's a whole nother story. Uh, a Walt Hetzler story. I could tell you about doing anesthesia in Vietnam in a barn. Um, yeah. But uh, it's not just ether. Uh, ISO will, isofluorine will do it. Halothane will do it. Any of the gases are going to kind of travel down there and yeah, they're not going to catch on fire but let's say you drop something onto the floor and you went down there searching for it and you're crawling around on the floor too long, you might pass out. You know what I mean? (laughs) So again, uh, it's just got, it's got some quirks to it. And because the waste gas is not being taken away, like in the operating room, it's something that you have to consider and warn people about as well. Kind of a deal. Um, Delivery systems. I would hope that when we're talking about this, that you've got a vaporizer and we're, we're talking about either the tri service or the one that you guys trained on in schoolhouse, uh, the IU pack vaporizer. It, that thing's great. If you know how to use it, uh, type of a deal. Um, and there's little quirks to it, but one of the great things that you ever trained on it was, man, you could use it in so many different ways. And, compared to any other type of anesthesia machine, it really was light packable into a small case, even a backpack. It's going to be a little heavy, but, um, and it just had so many different gases that you could use with it, including ether even, um, that it was very, you could take it almost to any country and find a gas that you were going to be able to use with that vaporizer and therefore be able to, it, with the dial on the top, um, it's got the Mac values on the dial. So it's got the percentages when you're turning, you did this at the schoolhouse, you know, isofluorine, you could turn it to that one, let's say 1.2% and be close, you know, type of thing. And so you, you think, even though you don't have a gas analyzer, you're in the ballpark of what you ought to see. If I did have a gas analyzer, that makes it much safer. Um, and I'm able to, uh, have better control for what I'm doing type of thing versus the open air technique. Now, like I said, in that 1944 video, they do a good job of showing how, you know, you take something like a, this is a Schimmelbusch mask, uh, that kind of comes apart and basically you would put about five pieces of gauze on the top of this, right? And it would pinch the gauze down in here, and it looks just like a mask yep. okay, that I'm going to put onto the patient. And then I would have my bottle of ether, and it had its two little tubes coming out of it called a Bellamy dropper. And I would just start to gently pour that onto the face of the patient uh, through the gauze, not directly, obviously. Yep. Um, and, it, and it's funny, they had a very good technique where it was very specific. You had to have five or six pieces of gauze. Because if you only have one piece of gauze, it turned into waterboarding. You know what I mean? That's not, that's not good. Right. (laughs) Um, Versus uh, if you put too many pieces of gauze on it, it's hard to breathe through and they couldn't pick up the vapor as well. So it just didn't, it work as well. So they, they kind of had a sweet spot with the the five or six pieces of gauze. Um, And so, you know, they literally, that's, that's how anesthesia was done with, with the bottle and, and the gauze mask um, or just straight gauze, if that's all that they had at that point in time. Um, but again, you're bringing in all those other effects, you know, the waste gas is everywhere, um, especially on the floor, especially if it's ether, um, you know, so there's, there's a lot, it, it looks easy. It ain't as easy as it looks. 
Because you got to remember, those people trained on that, and they were very astute in what they were doing, and everybody was on the same sheet of music with how they were doing that. Um, But it can be done. You know, that's the that is the other thing with very limited amount of supplies. You know, it can be done. Um, You can also not just uh, drop ether. Uh, Halothane can work that way. I've never never seen isofluorine done that way because it never had to be done that way. but um, something to consider. The one thing about ether, when people always bring this up to me, um, is you have to remember though, that ether has a boiling point of about 94, 95 degrees. And if you get in a very, very hot climate, you can't just pour it out of the bottle. It will literally boil and vaporize before it ever gets to the mask. Uh, type of a deal. And so um, when you go back and look at uh, some of the old school ways they they uh, would deal with that is they, they would make these ether jar type setups. You know, there's okay. just the old mason jar setup. Um, and they would put cotton balls in here. And, you know, the ether would soak up into the cotton ball so it wouldn't just boil off right off the bat. And then they would have the patient basically breathe through this tube. And then the other tube was to allow, obviously, the the air to come in, they let them breathe it for a while and then they take it away from them. Almost like a fentanyl lollipop kind of a deal, you know? Yeah. Like once they got where they want, well, let me take it away for a minute, you know, type of deal. But there were different types of those contraptions, you know, back in the day, if if you were in a very hot environment and just pouring it onto the gauze just wasn't going to work. So you can think of like the Philippines or Iraq or, you know, any of those places where, it's 120 degrees outside you know it's yeah. it's gonna be a long day because it's not right. gonna work you know kind right. of a deal so so there, there's that as far as like the delivery side of the house um and the other thing i always uh kind of warn people about because uh we we go down some of these rabbit holes is that um if I have a vaporizer, I damn sure better better be using the vaporizer, not doing the open air technique, right? <laughs> or, or if I, I watched the 1944 video and they're like, well, they didn't use pulse oxes and they didn't use entitled CO2 and they, you know, and everything was fine. It's like, yeah, but if I've got it and you're not using it, that's the wrong damn answer. Period. Right. You they also I mean? killed like, a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, it was not as safe back then because of those inventions, right? <laughs> So don't ever come to me and be like, I was just too lazy to put the pulse ox on, you know, or right. I just, you know, was too lazy to, I had entitled CO2, but nah, you know, like, nah, it's the wrong answer, dude. You know, right. same thing with, with the gas. It's like, if I have a vaporizer, yes, I absolutely better be using it because it's, it's going to be better control and, and, uh, you know, safer to use than it is just the open air technique. So that being um, said. One quick yeah, question. Go ahead. So, and yeah. end title. I I have an Emma, so that's obviously mm-hmm. going to be in line with my airway. You have the gas going through the monitor. Um, does that throw off your end title readings, or are those do those two things not mix at all? No, they don't mix at all. In fact, like back to the RGM side of the house, the the gas analyzer and the OR, mm-hmm. uh, the reason it's so expensive and so big is it analyzes all the gases all at once, you know, okay. kind of a thing. Uh, the Emma uh, just happens to be geared to pick up on the CO2 yeah. type of the house. But the other, if uh, desflurane is going through that same tube, it's, it's just, it's not going to affect it. You know, okay. in fact, when the M, when the Emma's first came out, you know, because where I worked, a big part of what we do is uh, research and development and testing and evaluation of all the stuff, you know, that would come out. Um, we were able to take them into the OR and safely hook them up and also be able to see what the real machine was using and correlate those values, you know, okay. and be able to say, like, the Emma says in title CO2 is 40, the RGM or whichever gas analyzer I have says 40 okay, or it's close, 39, 40, you know. Yeah. And we, we no, we never saw anything like, because we were using anesthesia gas at the same time, and there was no, like, you know, 
big discrepancy in the two. So yeah, you can actually absolutely hook it up and trust the number uh, okay. as long as you know you've got the mass sealed and and everything's working properly. Sure, right. That's a good question. Um, yeah. So another question about the mask. So I have seen going into the ORs, just watching. Nobody lets me touch uh-huh. anything. Um, <laughs> That's a wrong answer. They should let you touch. Come on, man. Uh, <laughs> I don't look like I okay. belong anywhere, right? Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> me me um, either, dude. Yeah. <laughs> but um, they don't always intubate everybody. Sometimes right. I've seen them with an, just an OPA. They, they have uh-huh. a patent. They make sure that they have a patent airway. They don't always yeah. have a secure airway. Um, uh-huh. is it, especially since I'm taking this person, you know, to that level three, so I can uh-huh. do surgery on them. Sure. Shouldn't we always secure their airway? No, you don't have to. Um, okay. And in fact, a lot of it, it, it depends. It depends on the surgery. It depends on the sure. patient. There's, there's multiple things that goes into that question, but quite often, if I don't have to go through the little bit of trauma of putting an in, uh, endotracheal tube through your vocal cords, um, I'm not going to, you know, if okay. there's not a reason to do that, I can plenty of surgeries get done around the world with things like the LMA and, or, yep. you know, and, King LT is another kind of a thing to use like that. And they're breathing anesthesia gas through it as well. You know what I mean? The other, yep. the other uh, type of case that we still do today where you don't use anything but just straight gas normally is with uh, kids having PE tubes put in. Yep. And that is uh, a very fast uh, case. It's a mask induction is a legitimate, no kidding mass induction where they actually do go through stage two going to sleep and then they come through stage two waking back up um it's just harder to get into the or to see that you know with what you're kind of saying it's very easy to go see the other cases kind of a thing um so you know yes we can absolutely do a lot of these things with just a mask if if it's just I, i will tell you this if you're doing a mass case and they, they made us do it in school, guess what? You cannot use the LMA. You're going to do mass cases today. And you're like, Oh my God. Cause it's, it's a pain dude. And yeah. if you really want to get down to it, it's like, well, how about I put this LMA in? It's just as safe. And I don't have to sit here, you know, and, and deal with this airway. Cause my hands like, in a you know, a claw cramp because all I'm doing is holding this mask on, but they make you do it to prove the point. But it's a, it's a very good question, you know, no. um, because it can absolutely be done safely depending on the surgery uh, and depending on, you know, the patient not having some comorbidity that says, no, you shouldn't do that, you know, type okay. of a deal. So, yeah, no, it's a great question. Because um, I know like with ketamine, especially using ketamine, I, I use a lot of ketamine, um, mm-hmm. You get that hypersalivation and always worry mm-hmm. about like, ah, uh, like it could be an airway risk. Um, do I want to constantly be playing games or do I just want to secure the airway and be done with it? Yeah, well, I mean, again, it depends on in the field. Uh, you you got to remember securing the airway uh, may be the only option and it may be uh-huh. the safest option and you do it. Um securing the airway in the field though, a lot of times means putting a crike in yep. versus uh, I don't bring all my stuff to do the intubations and that's all changed. Right. Yeah. Um, so can I get the crike in? Is it worth getting the crike in? Do I have to get the crike in? You know, how far am I willing to go with this deal where I could have just done this with a mask? I could have done it safely and not, you know, cut the dude's throat you know, kind right. of a deal, Strugg- struggling kind of a thing. So I also think it's important to realize, like, you can do just sedation cases with gas. Mm-hmm. And sedation cases are just in that stage one. You don't even go to stage two. You know, yeah. you just keep them in that stage one and that kind of, you know, uh, kind of twilight sleep zone and do whatever you need to do. And then they actually wake up pretty quick. That's That's actually another way to do it as well. You know, okay. kind of a thing. So, uh, but no, great question, man. Yeah. 
but okay. you can absolutely do it safely. Yeah. Okay. Um, so some of the pros of gas that we've been talking about, you know, is the fact that it is, the, it can be a sole agent strictly by itself, you know, uh, in the field. Um, you got to remember, uh, you may find uh, gas anesthesia in the strangest places. One of the things about uh, ether is that in third world countries, you can produce it. Hell, you can re- produce it in the local high school chemistry lab. It's that mm. easy to, to kind of do. Um, it's incredibly cheap. Uh, and in fact, I, I was reading an article not too long ago where they were suggesting that maybe all these countries ought to be producing their own ether instead of trying to buy these more expensive anesthesia gases. And they could do a lot more with less, you know, kind mm. of a deal. Um, so it, it can work in the, uh, you know, the austere environment. You would also be surprised where you may fa- find halothane out there, you know, um, which comes in kind of a reddish label bottle. isofluorine has been around a long time. It's, it's cheap. You know, you can find it out there. It's in kind of a purplish uh, label color bottle type of a deal. So the other thing to think about too is, uh, you know, where to get it other places, veterinary clinics use isofluorine every day. Mm-hmm. You know, they use it. They, it's the same stuff, you know, and they have vaporizers too. I'm just saying, yep. um, not advocating anything, just saying where yep. you can find stuff. All right. Um, uh, and the other thing about uh, gas is if you are in a severely limited supply situation and you have it, um, you have options that you may not have with some of the other things. You know, if I'm out of ketamine, I'm out of IV tubing, I'm out of all these things. Um, it may be it, you know, and, uh, people ask like, well, do I have to start an IV, you know, to do gas anesthesia? And the answer is absolutely. If you have it, but they did it for a long time without having IVs, you know, I'll, I'll just say that, you know what I mean? Back to that thing I said before, if you have it, absolutely use it. But if you were in the worst case scenario and you're like, I don't have it, you know, can I sedate this person, you know, with gas and and an open drop technique? And yeah, you actually could do that. And it's covering all the pillars that you would need it to do. Um, So, yeah, Um, some of the cons of it would be back to the delivery method, though. You know, uh, if I'm using some of those uh, techniques, the waste gas, you know, the fact that I have to go through stage two to get them down to stage three, just putting them to sleep. And that's a danger zone versus if I was able to do some IV uh, agent to help me out Uh, in the field, the lack of monitoring uh, that you just don't have in the hot that the hospital has, you know, so I cannot see that back value um, that I would really like to be able to see. Um, It does uh, gas will, uh, and depending on the agent, it, it does cause cardiovascular, uh, suppression, the deeper that you go. And a lot of times that starts on the arterial blood pressure side, but we'll eventually move over into cardiac output in those, uh, those areas as well. The deeper, deeper, deeper I go. Um, I will tell you in trauma, um, in the hospital, even, uh, if we, uh, put somebody to sleep, they have to prove to us to be able to turn the gas on because many a time with somebody who has a, uh, a low blood pressure will say, and you're like, I think I can turn the gas on and you just crack the vaporizer open, you know, and the next blood pressure is like, boom, you know, like, Oh, you know, I can't turn it off fast enough yet. You know, that kind of a deal. Yeah. Um, so it, it will get there. Um, the other thing that it does, um, especially ether, good Lord, uh, post-op nausea and vomiting when they're waking up. Um, you, you used to hear all the stories of people just yakking their brains out. Um, but there's 30, 35% of people waking up for ether that are going to puke, you know, okay. um, not quite as much with like a halothane or an isoflurane, but even, even those, you know, there's, you know, post-op nausea and vomiting, you know, just be ready for it. If you have Zofran, you can give them beforehand. Absolutely do that. Um, and 
one of the other things that anesthesia gas does, it uh, inhibits what's called hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, um, or HPV is what we call it. Um, HPV uh, is a body's uh, compensatory mechanism in the lungs that if a part of the lung tissue is not being ventilated very well, the body will shunt the blood away from that area to areas that are getting better ventilated, and that keeps my pulse ox up, okay? Um, but the gas agents inhibit that function. Now, in the operating room, we're always given supplemental oxygen, and so you don't see the dips in the pulse ox because you're given supplemental oxygen. But the chance of having supplemental oxygen in, you know, the austere environment is very low, right? Yeah. So, so you are going to see the pulse ox. It may start out, you know, 98, 98, 98, and then it starts to come down and, starts to, and it may start hovering at 94, 95 because of that very reason that it's blocking that response. Um, and it'll fool you a little bit if you're not kind of thinking through, okay, what's going on kind of deal. If I had supplemental oxygen in the field, am I going to use it? Yeah, absolutely. You know, right. and it will, it will keep that, that number back up higher as well, but just something to consider. Um, contraindications as far as the gas anesthesia, there's one big one. It's, it's, not uh, very common, but it's malignant hypothermia, a history of it mm -hmm. or a family history of it. Um, there's a special test that has to be done to even know that if you've actually got it. But if you have a history of malignant hypothermia or maybe your dad had a history of it or you do not want to give them gas because if they go into a malignant hypothermia, you don't have the there's only a drug to use and it's dantrolene and you don't have it. You're not going to have it. And it's a whole bunch of it. In fact, there's a very special cart in the operating room. You can ask just like a crash cart. It's called the malignant hypothermia cart. It's a whole cart. You know what <laughs> I mean? It's full yeah. of dantrolene. And also in there is the stuff to mix it up. And it takes like one to two people to do nothing but mix it, to hand it off, to give, to give it, you know, it's yeah. that kind of involved. You don't want to, you don't want any part of that. So if for any reason you had a team member, team member that said, you know, my dad had it or just say, no, just do right. something else. You know what I mean? Give right. him a fifth of Jack Daniels and say, I'm sorry, dude, this is the best we can do. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. But you don't want to use it. And then the other really contraindication, like I was talking about before is if you are considering using ether is any kind of open flame, uh, any kind of thing that's going to produce a spark, any kind of electric cautery or anything along those lines, um, you're just going to have to be very vigilant of the fact that, you know, that ether could ignite. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, like I said, it's it's in the tissues of the body. So, you know, back then, if you were to do that and ignite, it could literally ignite the internal part of the body. <laughs> You know, if you're doing an open uh, abdomen case, like it could be on fire. And it that would be the most, I don't know, horrifying thing ever. Uh, so just, you know, just say no. Now, right. I say that because all your surgeons, you know, use electric cautery. I mean, come on. And, you know, like uh, back to, you know, talking with Dave Harden, you know, mm -hmm. over in Africa, you know, if he had it, he, he would be using it. Um, it's just he didn't have it a lot you know, right. or maybe not at all at times, you know, and it's like, okay. Uh, but you definitely want to be the person that says, okay, we're going to use ether. All right. right. Before we do this, number one, you know, yeah. here's the thing we're not, we're not going to do uh, kind of a deal. So, yeah. So just a quick thing on ether and obviously you need ventilation. It, ro mm -hmm. it goes to the ground. Could you just roll up if you happen to have a tent or, doors or whatever that's low, could you just open them and vent that off quicker? Or are you just inviting yeah. more fire things around the Well, you know, you would have to you would have to look and see like where is it going? You mm -hmm. know, uh where, which way is the wind blowing? And the more that it it gets out into uh the atmosphere, it's gonna dissipate out, you know, okay. to the point where it, it's not gonna ignite. Um it's just we tend to do these things in places like, I don't know, 
we're, we're talking about doing this in like back of a vehicle or yeah. a small safe house room or all these yeah. areas where uh, there's not a lot of ventilation. You know, yeah. I would absolutely love ventilation. Um, and if you have that ability uh, to be able to, you know, open that door, what, just be mindful of where it's going to tend to go. Where's the airflow going? And therefore, where is that? Where is it going to go seek out, you know, yep. kind of a deal. So you got to remember the other thing about ether. It burns clean. So it's like Ricky Bobby on fire. You know, right. I mean, it's like, I can't, you can't see it. You know, you, you can't see it, you know. Right. Um, you can feel it, I'm sure. You can, Yeah, you can feel it. Um, but, you know, that, that that would be the other danger of it is that it, it would burn clean unless, you know, something else was going on. But, uh, yeah, so there's that. But again, I, you know, it, it, and it's like, oh my God, you know, and it's like, you know, but you got to remember the 1846 to 19, almost 80, they were doing this every single day in the operating yep. room and doing it well and, you know, safely. Right. You know what I mean? Uh, are we safer now? Sure. Absolutely. We've made a lot of progress. Um, but, you know, uh, progress doesn't live in some of the countries that we're in. It just doesn't. That's true. You That's know? true. And, and there's times we just have to figure things out. And, um, you know, a, a lot, too, what we're talking about is um, a lot of the cases that we're really talking about are more sedation anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and so could I safely sedate, you know, uh, my patient to do this small procedure if all I had was gas and the answer is absolutely. You could just be very vigilant, mm -hmm. um, and watch for those warning signs of stage two, get to the operating room, go in and watch those cases. Um, not only to see the beginning of them, but absolutely. I mean, specifically go in and say, I am here to look at the aspects of gas anesthesia, to see it on the monitor, to see it on the, you know, coming uh, how it works out of the vaporizer, um, where the waste gas is going here. Uh, but more importantly, that waking up, what does stage three look like? What does stage two especially look like? And then what does that stage one look like just as they're coming back? You know, yeah. and if I can, if I can do that, I promise you, that is one of those things that you just, it ingrains in your brain. You just don't forget, you know, that's, that's one of those events, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it's not like you'd have to get in there once a week or anything. You get in there a couple of times and really see that it will, it will solidify in your brain what that looks like. So that would be my, my biggest thing for people is, is um, get it, get in there, do some things. Um, practice, you know, practice what you can with what you're allowed to do. Um, but then uh, that way, you're not just reading about it in the book and pulling it out at the last second, you know, like, oh, right. God, you know, I saw the video from 1944. Hold my beer. Watch this. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> um, but it's a great video. I, I'll, I'll right. just say that it's, it's pretty good. And you got to love the narration back then. Those people knew how to talk on video, not like me. You know what I mean? They had proper people speaking on a video. You know what I mean? Nice. So nice. Yeah, it, was, it was good stuff, man. So Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you, Brad. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. It was fun, man. It's, it's always fun to dig into some of these topics. For today's podcast, be sure to go to our website, www.prolongfieldcare.org. Find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Subscribe and stay on the bleeding edge of combat medicine. This is Dennis for the PFC Podcast. Out.